French airborne troops used the Fury 25 exercise to send a clear signal about where they believe the next gains in land combat will come from, the thin slice of air just above the treetops. Over several days of high-tempo drills, units centered on the 1st Parachute Hussar Regiment treated that airspace not as a hazard to be survived but as a maneuver corridor to be organized, contested, and exploited. They did it by synchronizing small surveillance platforms with immersive FPV-style training and mobile jamming, compressing the time between spotting a threat, deciding what to do, and acting on it. The result was less a display of any single gadget than an emerging method of warfighting tuned to the physics and frictions of very low-altitude flight. What distinguished Fury 25 from many field exercises was the routine, almost mundane employment of drones as organic tools rather than niche attachments. Hand-launched reconnaissance aircraft provided persistent eyes, while compact quadcopters flashed in and out of dead ground to confirm what scouts suspected. Operators were expected to use these assets the way riflemen use optics, reflexively, repeatedly, and in context with movement on the ground. The EB Vision System, originating with SenseFly and now part of Ag Eagle, served as the backbone for tactical ISR, streaming imagery to teams that needed it without the latency of large, centralized architectures. Parrot-built platforms, already familiar to French ground forces, filled the close reconnaissance niche where silence, agility, and fast redeployment matter more than raw endurance. Fury 25 also wrestled with a question that haunts every army watching FPV munitions reshape battlefields, how do you train the fine motor skills, attack geometry judgment, and stress tolerance that define FPV success without accepting the risks of live explosives? The French answer on display was MAPI, an inert, pilot-in-the-loop training construct that recreates the sensory and cognitive workload of FPV strikes. Crews practiced approach profiles, target recognition at speed, and final run corrections with the freedom to iterate, debrief, and repeat on a tight loop. This kind of rehearsal matters because the decisive factors in FPV employment are not just electronics and airframes, they are human timing, perception, and decision-making when seconds feel short and inputs are noisy. Countering the proliferating aerial threat was given equal weight. The Nera Jammer from MC2 Technologies featured prominently as a maneuverable protective bubble, designed to disrupt control links across several frequency bands and deny hostile drones the last meters they need for accurate observation or terminal effects. The choice to push jamming forward with assault elements rather than hold it in static sanctuaries reflects a broader doctrinal shift, protection must travel at the speed of the fight. By integrating electronic warfare at the lowest tactical echelons, the regiments involved sought to turn counter-UAS from a specialist's episodic task into a routine accompaniment to patrols, raids, and fire support. The exercise's sponsors did not pretend that the kit mix is frozen. Experimental platforms rotated through scenarios to test link resilience in cluttered urban canyons, evaluate sensors at dawn and dusk, and probe how well controllers could hand off targets while on the move. That curiosity is institutionalized through the Army's Innovation and Experimentation Hub, the Pol Rayonment de l'Armi de Terra, PRAT, which helps stitch together user feedback with engineering tweaks. If the message of the week was that the third dimension near the ground has become decisive, the subtext was that the French army wants to measure that claim with data rather than slogans, and adjust procurement to match what field tests actually reveal. Organizationally, Fury 25 brought together the 11th Parachute Brigade and the 35th Parachute Artillery Regiment alongside the Hussars. That pairing mattered. Artillery lives by observation and timing, airborne units live by tempo and surprise. Small UAS touch both. They trim the guesswork from fire adjustment, keep eyes on moving targets when vehicles displace, and expose the seams where light infantry can punch through before defenders reset. In scenarios where both sides employed drones, the tempo advantages went to the formations that paired reconnaissance with electronic effects, denying the opponent persistent sight lines while preserving their own. That dynamic, sensor fusion plus denial, is the heart of modern counter-reconnaissance. The practical lessons were mostly unglamorous, and all the more important for it. 
Battery logistics became a command concern, with charging plans tied to maneuver routes and rest cycles. Radio discipline had to be enforced ruthlessly to reduce self-inflicted interference. Leaders learned to treat drone tasking like artillery, pre-plan likely requests, allocate windows, and reserve bandwidth for the unexpected. The most successful teams treated airborne sensors as extensions of their own senses, not outsourced capabilities, and they built redundancy into everything, from spare airframes to alternate landing zones, because small platforms fail in small but predictable ways. There are strategic implications in this tactical story. High-intensity combat has not erased the relevance of exquisite, long-range ISR, but it has forced armies to confront the brutal arithmetic of attrition in the close fight. The side that can cheaply regenerate local reconnaissance, simulate strike effects without burning munitions, and blunt the other's aerial prying will more often set the battle's rhythm. Fury 25 showcased a French approach that accepts the messiness of the low-altitude layer and invests in it anyway, teach soldiers to fly, to jam, to hide, and to interpret, equip them with platforms good enough to survive the first contact and cheap enough to be replaced after the tenth. The legal and ethical contours of this evolution were not ignored. Training with inert FPV surrogates, tightening positive identification drills, and codifying deconfliction rules help preserve discipline when a few dozen grams of airframe can decide a firefight. At the same time, pushing electronic warfare forward raises questions about electromagnetic fratricide and the protection of civilian infrastructure in real operations. The French emphasis on repeatable training under realistic constraints, a city block mocked up in a field, a tree lean made treacherous by clever adversary playbooks, suggests a recognition that technology alone cannot solve judgment problems. Only practice, feedback, and institutional memory can. Perhaps the most striking outcome of Fury 25 is how ordinary drones looked by the end, not silver bullets, not novelties, but everyday tools that enable combined arms to function at modern speed. EB Vision provided the steady drip of context without which units stumble, parrot airframes darted into places maps do not show, Mapy made dangerous learning safe and scalable, Narod kept enemy eyes off French troops when it mattered most. None of these systems guarantees victory. Together, and in the hands of soldiers who treat the air at latter height as terrain to be read and shaped, they make victory more probable. That is the quiet revolution underway, turning the lowest layer of the sky from a blind spot into the most contested and useful real estate on the battlefield.